Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about The Rise of the Occult, a new book by author Charles Franny. That's right. We're going to look at the secrets that former Satanists, Wiccans, and exorcists want you to know about how to protect yourself from the dangers of the occult. This book is tremendous, and it's dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel and to Our Lady of Sorrows, and how important it is in the battle against evil to turn to these amazing intercessors. <laughs> Yeah, really excited about this episode. We had Charles on for his first book, Slaying Dragons. This is it right here. A number of years ago, back when we were in Houston, and boy, that was just a, a fascinating conversation. Your authorship really comes from a research angle. And so he's done the same thing and expanded it from exorcists into uh, folks that have been in the occult or priests that have dealt with situations. And, and it's really twice the size of the initial book. Mm -hmm. This is Slaying Dragons 2. And the amount of saints that you have in here, Charles, is very, very impressive. As I've been looking through this book, the contributors of this book are some of the most epic people throughout the history of Christendom. And I can't wait to really unpack this book for our viewers and our listeners on YouTube and on all of the audio platforms, because this is an important thing to realize that throughout our journey and in, in living out the Christian faith, it is something that is confronted by the powers of evil and demonic influences. And, you know, we are in the battle and it helps us tremendously. And your show helped us tremendously, the last one, to get a sense of what we're looking at through the eyes of exorcists. Yeah, the last episode we did with you, Charles, is one of the most viewed episodes ever. Almost a half a million people viewed it. And I think that shows the unease that people feel and they can see the clear and present danger that evil presents in the modern world. So, how does this book differ from Slaying Dragons, and what particularly do people, should they know about the occult? Yeah, so this book um, was conducted once I, this is the first book that I produced after going full time. You know, thanks be to God, I left teaching after 10 years because of the success of Slaying Dragons and was able to, again, thanks be to God, make all these connections to exorcists and former occultists, people who've been in the occult and left. Um, and I was able to conduct my own interviews up to about, about 40 interviews, 38, 39 interviews with, uh, I think it was 16 former occultists, uh, eight exorcists, seven parish priests, six families, and a whole host of just other anecdotes from people that I met along the way, including lots of research from just what's going on in the world. So it's, it's very similar to Slaying Dragons, so the original one, mm -hmm. but it differs because it's... Uh, it's more on the ground. It's it's the saying mm. dragons was a lot of theological instruction, practical sacramental prayer approaches, how, how the demons are operating, what they're doing, just things we need to know. But this is what's going on. It's mm -hmm. like boots on the ground. Like mm -hmm. take slaying dragons and put it into real life. Like especially because there's really there's a scourge or a plague you could say of the occult. You're just striking our world now. So we need to know the spiritual warfare that was laid out in slaying dragons in order to face this giant, this this new rise of a religion. That's, yeah. that's striking yeah, the world. That's, that's quite a progression uh, in your <clears throat> authorship. Um, what, when you were going into this, what were some of the um, some of the perspectives that you had that were maybe changed by some of the people that you interviewed? Yeah, well, uh, going into the work, I was rather clueless about the uh, the presence of the occult, the power of the occult, the how widespread it was, what kind of things people were getting into. Um, I think I was though the last chapter of Slaying Dragons talks about the occult. And so I knew it was out there. I knew it was prevalent. I knew the statistics were on the rise, but I didn't get how how widespread it really was and how it's so subtle. Mm -hmm. And it has worked its way into society, worked its way into schools, into programming, and um, is really, this is a great word, surreptitious. I remember reading that in a Vatican document about mm -hmm. the New Age, I think mm -hmm. it was. It just sneaks in. It's like a snake, like serpent. And uh, all of a sudden, we, we realize that we have adopted occultic philosophies, which are really mm -hmm. running rampant. Um, throughout the culture. For our listeners, what is the occult? Can you tell them simply what the occult is and what it encompasses? Yeah, so that's that's the thing that um, the rise of the occult. So picking that word, because that's why I worked it in. If you look at the, the cover, which is Wiccans, <clears throat> New Agers, Satanists, because not everybody knows what occult means or mm -hmm. what an occultist is. People know about the New Age. They've heard of witches, Wiccans, Satanists. They know all that. 
So I was looking for a term that would be a catch-all, would grab it all together. And more and more, I'm like, I just, I, I got to go with occult because it fits. And eventually people will figure it out, will understand. So occult means, it comes from the Latin, which means hidden or secret or uh, in the dark, in the shadows. Mm -hmm. So the occult refers to um, religious practices outside of Christianity, pagan practices, uh, rituals that are intended to tap into secret powers, hidden powers, secret knowledge, kind of like the Gnostics, mm -hmm. um, to obtain things that are not mm -hmm. otherwise permissible for us to obtain. If you think about, uh, who was it? Uh, King Saul, who tried to try to conjure Samuel. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he, that was an occultic <clears throat> practice, mm -hmm. and so the occult. Uh, so that's what the occult is. It, it includes all kinds of um, superstitious practices that break faith with God, go against mm. the proper channel of grace, the proper channel of divine revelation. Um, and it's all about, and we can get into this as we go, but it's all about me. It's about the will. It's like what I want. Like some Satanists refer to themselves as atheists, like they worship themselves as Ooh. God. And uh, that's what's um, in the background of all the occult. Mm. In chapter two, your, <clears throat> your title of that chapter is most people are blind to the occult in their midst. And, you know, as you got into the research, because, you know, we shared even after the last show, just how impressed uh, we are with your approach to this from the standpoint, uh, not only of your prayerful reverence and humility in, in regard to uh, entering into this ministry in the church, but also your, your breadth of study as it, re, as it relates to that. Um, you referenced scripture. Um, as as a point of contact with a cult, but then also there's a there's a sense of many of these saints are kind of scattered throughout the history of Christendom. You know, as you researched, I'm just curious to find like, was it always the case that people were blind to some of these uh, occult movements, and how did it influence community life? How did it influence society, and how can we kind of pair that to opening up our eyes to the occult today and be more aware? Yeah, so you touched on a number of things. Hopefully I can remember uh, all of them. Because like the origin of this idea was um, when I was listening to an exorcist give a talk mm -hmm. on the occult in the Old Testament and the occult in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And what he was saying was just uh, like, that was right after I went full time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, I've never heard this before. Like the occult is the the Old Testament world, even the New Testament world when Jesus came on the scene was saturated in the occult. And I kind of, it made sense when he said it, but when he's, when he laid it out, like seriously, like this is, this mm. was an occultic world from the fall all the way to when our Lord established the church, the world was fighting the kingdom of Satan. And that just uh, changed my whole perspective on scripture. Mm. So when I, now when I, I pulled a lot of scripture um, mm. into this book, because the scripture talks so much about the occult, about the battle with evil, uh, the evil of our days, um, the wiles of the devil. Uh, but w in one of that, I can't remember which chapter it is, maybe three or four, I talk about the history of the, the church's struggle with the occult. There's a great work by Sister Antoinette Pratt from 1915. It was published, I think, at Catholic University of America, where she goes through from the very beginning of the church mm. all the way up until the modern times of the church's battle with the occult, with priests getting into it, mm. laity getting into it, when they try to convert countries and they don't fully convert them and the occult rises up again, witchcraft, everything we're seeing now mm -hmm. has been around since the beginning. Yeah, even our first pope, I mean, St. Peter was fighting Simon Magus, you know? I yeah. mean, that goes back to the very beginning of Christianity is the fight against the occult. And it's interesting what the catechism says about the occult. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it categorizes or puts the occult under offenses against the third commandment that you shall have no other gods before me. So catechism 216 uh, says, all forms of div divination are to be rejected, recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future, consulting horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpretations of omens and lots, the phenomenon of clairvoyance and recourse to all mediums all conceal a desire for power over time, mm -hmm. history, and in the last analysis, other human beings, as a well as a wish to conciliate hidden powers. They contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. They're an attempt to tear apart the veil and see behind the veil that God has put up rightfully, to, you know, as, as a barrier between the the Almighty and us, His creation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and that is one of the things that some of the people that I interviewed were talking about, like this um, uh, Andrew. So I picked a lot of saint names, if you see in the beginning, mm -hmm. as the pseudonyms for mm -hmm. all the people um, 
even the priests I gave pseudonyms. I, so I picked all these great mm -hmm. saints just so it scatters, uh, kind of sanctifies the pages mm -hmm. as pseudonyms for these people. So Andrew, uh, he said that he went into the occult. It was uh, Thelema um, or Thelema, however you pronounce it, because he wanted to he wanted to encounter the supernatural, the preternatural, and he did, and it backfired. Mm. He said it was like trying to figure out what what death really was by playing with a loaded gun. Mm. Like that's the good analogy <clears throat> for it. That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. So that, that I, I had to steal that so quote. So what 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 was what was the backfire? I mean, we all we all know that when we sin, there's a uh, there's a backfiring going on. Mm -hmm. We all experience that. What what is it when you enter into something like that? What what was his response to to the backfiring? What happened? Yeah. So that that gets into the crux of the of the book. Like what happens when you dive into the occult, mm. and it's just uh, manipulation. Um, subjugation, slavery, um, a complete destruction of your your intellect, your intellect's like right reasoning, and then it spills over into your life, your life itself. Like when he, um, so he he struggles still with with humility because he worshipped his will in in Thelema or Thelema. The, the will is the central thing. The will is your will and accomplishing what you want is the whole goal of the religion. That's how you become a God. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this becoming God-like or becoming a God is the key. And the, the demons will just egg you on. He said, that's one of the things that like demons will show up in the occult. They will do things. They will speak. They will communicate. They will manifest. And they treat, they will mock you though. It's all a game. It's all a game. And he didn't realize it until it was too late. Because uh, when he converted, uh, like it, there were some diabolical attacks against himself, against his home, his house burned down, and he's wow. not sure if God just allowed it to happen or if it was a diabolical attack. Mm -hmm. Either one is mm -hmm. a fair game. Uh, they, they seemed to go after his daughter when they were converting because the daughter was acting out all these strange ways. Eventually it passed and they converted, got baptized, and, and things resolved. But um, yeah, destruction, the, the eclipse of truth is one of the sub- uh, mm -hmm. subtitles in one of the, the chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's blinding to the occultists. Like they mm -hmm. no longer see what is real, what is true. And they're living in this fantasy world. Mm -hmm. yeah. How were you able to land some of these uh, interviews and, and you know, um, learn what you did along the way for this second book now? Yeah. Um, by God's providence, um, because of the success of Slaying Dragons and I gave some parish talks, I got to know people. I was active on social media and I got to know some people there. And some of the big fans of the book mm -hmm. ended up being former occultists. Wow. And then I didn't realize Because they that. probably understood the gravity of what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. It's like some people... And they're are, probably interested in learning more of the truth around what happened to them yeah. too as well. And when they read Slaying Dragons, they were like, they would retweet and like tell everybody, buy this book. It's true. Yeah. It, this is what demons do. This is how mm -hmm. demons act. This mm -hmm. is what, this is how powerful sacraments and sacramentals are. Mm -hmm. Buy this book, buy this book. And eventually I started to just kind of read between the lines and the tweets. And I, and I reached out to a few of them, like, were you a witch at one point? And then they were like, yeah, I was. And then some of these people mm -hmm. I actually knew through another connection. Mm -hmm. So at first <clears throat> you might be like, well, how do you know that they're, they're real? They're really yeah. <laughs> being honest. Um, well, I, I was able to verify that. And then that was just the first. And then a lot of priests I know, exorcists I know, pastors I know, like, you should talk to this person. Yeah. Mm. You should talk to this person. Wow. People coming through RCIA, like, you should talk to this person. Wow. And the, they were like, there's another person. Oh, wow. And then all these mm. things just opened up. And wow. I had to shut the gates of the interviews because mm. just it was too much. I'm like, I got to finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it it's been much bigger is what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and uh, we, we may be prefacing a Slaying Dragons 3 <laughs> in, in, in the coming uh, months and years. But, you know, the, the sense of what you are providing here and what in your, in your own term, like the sense of God's providence, God is providing to your hands uh, this work. And for your own intentionality and your own prayer life, you know, what is what what do you sense God's will being in relationship to this book and, you know, opening up people's eyes and and giving a sense of the occult and and helping people realize the these powers that they need to be uh, very aware of? Yeah, I think it's a it's a diagnostic tool. It's mm -hmm. um, a pull back the veil instrument because it people. We're so busy, like especially if you have a family. We're just so busy. We're so caught up in everything that we can't focus on what's going on. Like I was talking to a priest. He was talking about digital currency and all these other things. Just the other day, I'm like, mm, yeah, I don't, I don't have time to read the news, so I don't know what's going on. Right. 
and we don't public school our kids, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people do. But those parents who send their kids to public schools are so too busy to really interact with their kids. A lot of kids are kind of parentless because the parents are so busy. But what we need to know is that there is a religion, a new religion, converting the nation, converting the nations, slowly, subtly, surrept surreptitiously. And everybody has the blinders on. They don't want to see it. They they don't want to admit to it because it's hard work. And they don't even recognize it because it's been, we've been, like the whole image of the boiling the frog, that whole, mm -hmm. that whole concept. Mm -hmm. The occult, this occult philosophy back into the 60s with the whole sexual revolution has been sneaking in. Like if you look at a lot of the, the, the movers of the culture in the 60s, there was a lot of music. Like music cha transformed the culture. Mm -hmm. Woodstock, all that stuff. And a lot of those people were into the occult. Mm -hmm. A lot of their music uh, fomented the occult, was inspired by the occult. And it's, it's, it's popular now. The occult is popular and people are, are stuck in it and don't even realize it. They don't realize the power. They don't realize the, realize the danger. And a lot of priests <clears throat> don't realize the danger. So I'm hoping this book will help both parents... Um, and priests and youth realize that de playing with a Ouija board, okay, that's not just bad. That's serious business. And like people just always because talk, Hasbro made it, <laughs> right. it doesn't make it right, yeah. you know. And you've heard a lot of condemnations of the Ouija board, but it's a bigger problem than even those condemnations really communicate. Like, and it's mm -hmm. not just that. Like manifesting, like some of the statistics in the book. There's so many. It's hard for me to pull together sure. um, mm -hmm. in my memory, but. Uh, manifesting is one that people kept talking about. It's it's this will, just like Satanism, just like Thelema. It's where you try to will change into in working with the universe. Mm. Like, what is that? Mm. Um, but it's so common, it's even sneaking into Christianity, especially pro different Protestant groups. Like prosperity, the prosperity gospel has an occultic flair to it, uh, where you will things into existence. Like you almost mm. control God and cause him to bless you. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, there's, mm. there's a lot. A lot of different levels and... Things like that. Some um, are more serious than others, yeah. So there was, we went into basically into five things that all these former Satanists and exorcists want you to know about the occult. And I think the book, five main themes in the book, they're where is the occult present in today's world? Um, how does the occult lure people, especially the young people, into embracing it? What are the real dangers of even minorly being associated or even dabbling in this type of stuff? Even just through the most innocuous seeming uh, relationships with it. Uh, are demons really present in the occult? I mean, is this really demonic activity or is this imagined behavior by these occultists? And the last is how does a person escape from the prison that they create for themselves when they dabble in the occult? So those are the five things they want you to know mm, in this yeah. book that the testimonies time and time again are coming back to these five main themes. So Cheryl, Charles, where is the occult present in today's world? I mean, you mentioned things like in programming, in schools, in education. Where, do you, where are these people that you interviewed seeing the occult, um, you know, become crept into? Yeah, I would say one of the big ones is technology, yeah. especially the Internet. And one of the families whose um, daughter went off into the occult, kind of, you know, Catholic family, just went to college, something happened. They think it was a trauma. And this is a big issue in the book, the issue of wounds, which is picks up from the issue of wounds in Slaying Dragons. Um, but then um, the internet, the mom blames the internet and phones as the big culprit to sucking the girl into this occultic world because a lot, a lot of covens, a lot of witch covens are online. Like you don't meet in, in meet together. And a lot of, one of the big appeals of witchcraft, which modern witches are saying is you can do it at home. You can do it alone. So COVID mm -hmm. isolation was perfect for the explosion of the occult because the occult loves separation and isolation and also encourages it and then destroys the people once they're in it. Um, so technology is a big one. Um, even just public school programming is a huge story. It's in my book. Um, Catholic Vote did a great job kind of like confronting it, publicizing it and stopping it in the California Two or three years ago, California. In California? Yeah, of all places? Shocker. What? <laughs> but what they did was was a very alarming. They were promoting the rediscovery of the ancient indigenous Aztec deities that Christianity had had killed through theocide and were teaching the children to pray to mm. these gods, not to just remember culturally whatever, but to actually chant prayers to the deities mm. with the purpose of resurrecting these deities. And it was... It probably got in. It was in the school system for a little while before it was pulled, thanks to groups like Catholic Vote and other... Uh, I remember that story. Yeah. Mm. So that's in my book. And a lot of people don't... Like, it hits... There's so much bad news that people miss it. Like, oh, 
uh, you know, and pagan the news reel and the social media reels that yeah. continue to spin every single day. It's just one thing hits you. It's like, okay, I have a vague memory of that. Yeah. But then we're yeah. on to the next story and on yeah. to the next story and on to the next story. And we don't yeah. analyze it. We don't analyze it sociologically. We don't analyze it how it affected people, how it affected a community, mm -hmm. how it affected the, you know, and that's why research is so important. Um, and it's not, you know, like the, the thing that I, I appreciate about your approach, too, is that you're not, uh, you know, building up curiosity around these things. You're you're treating them sociologically. You're treating them with with uh, research and you're applying it so people can realize what's happening so that they could mobilize their own response properly in Christ and, and have a greater awareness. Yeah, yeah. I've got a <laughs> more of a practical question about. Uh, weekend and which and you know like you're mentioning yeah. all these things and like does that mean that somebody does it and then just teaches somebody else how to do it like what is the what is the relationship of the name of that to the practices because you know you were talking about manipulation and and obviously these people are, are have been blinded in a, a very deep and profound and disturbed way um how does one become something i mean a satanist i know is is somebody who's practices satanic rituals or whatever but you know you've got new age in here but the witches and wiccans like what what are those people because i've heard some stuff where they do stuff over your body to heal it or like a wiccan does something like that i'm just i don't know what one is so i don't sure. know how to spot one you know what i'm saying like <laughs> i guess right. that's where i'm going with it yeah you know? no it's the, and you mentioned another occult practice reiki I, you alluded Rick, to Ricky, it Ricky, oh, Ricky, Ricky. Oh, okay which is going to be in the so chakras yeah, aligning Shak your chakras, Shakiras. your chakras. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know your chakras in a line. Chakra. And uh, I, I talk about Reiki a little bit in this book, but there's a lot more to say, and that's going to be in the second volume of this book once that comes out, which I guess would be Slaying Dragons Three. I don't know how to title it. Now that I have Slaying Dragons Two, it's a little confusing. <laughs> I, see, I think it should be Slaying Dragons Two Part Two. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said you could do that. I'm like, and ah. if you need an endorsement, we have Pope Paul the Sixth, the Second. Oh, can, oh, that's right. I saw that, that episode. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but. Don't understand. I understand. You understand. So Wicca, uh, Wicca and witchcraft is something that I've kind of fleshed out more in the second volume because it's it's some people don't need to know that those details. Like mm -hmm. you said, yeah. curiosity. I try to avoid curiosity, unnecessary yeah. information. Please continue to do that. <laughs> yeah, and it, because people it can backfire. It again. can sure. So Wiccans and witches are very similar, though they are distinct. And there's one YouTube, one of the, part of my research, I um, watched a few videos from a witch on her YouTube channel. She has like two hundred thousand active subscribers to her channel just so you know mm -hmm. more than you guys do and a lot of like it comments like so the witchcraft world is is active it's mm -hmm. vibrant another one has four hundred thousand. but anyway she was talking about the difference between wiccans and witches and that there's uh, always a, like a not an in, not infighting but clarification clarification distinction we're not the same thing we're not the same thing so wiccans are bound by certain rules but they're not that's one of the things it's all a joke it's all made up like uh, <laughs> wicca was made up in like the 40s 50s 60s by just some guys some ladies <laughs> who know. said they found it's a gnosticism yeah. of like it's Scientology. Ancient, <laughs> you know ancient pagan religions from the british isles that's really about yeah. what it is it uh, all goes back to alistair crowley who yeah. was a mad crazy, man crazy dude crazy mad you know preternatural scientists, so to speak. But so it was made up. People go into Wicca thinking it's this ancient resuscit resuscitation of some ancient pagan religion, but it's not. It's just yeah. concocted through the inspiration of demons and just the curiosity of men. But so Wicca, they bind themselves, so to speak, to uh, the Wiccan reed and the, the rule of three, which is supposed to keep you from harming people and cursing people. But if you really know what Wicca is about as a Wiccan, you realize, mm, I don't have to do that. It's, it's all subjective morality. You know, right. it's, it's basically atheism. It's just they don't use that term. But then witchcraft is much broader. Um, mm. They don't, they're not bound by any rules. Like, so they're like, you they know, have no theology. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the minimal Wiccan theology is g absent from yeah. true witchcraft. And they're all different kinds of witches, uh, uh, hedge witchery and all these other so that's things. that's more of a, like a kitchen sink of all just, Yeah. People so, doing nutty stuff. Yeah, it's all the all the people with long noses with the warrant on it, throwing stuff, eyes and newt and stuff in there. Uh, but it's really, I think, a good way to describe witches are people who try to attempt to manipulate powers that don't belong to them. I mean, that's a pretty good catch-all term for them. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of ritual yeah. and in order to manipulate. Yeah, mm -hmm. gotcha. I think a, a good catechetical point at this point in the conversation is uh, from twenty one seventeen. All practices of magic or sorcery 
by which one attempts to tame occult powers so as to place them at one's service and have a supernatural power over others, even if this were for the sake of restoring their health, are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. Th- that's to the whole point yeah, of like yeah. a centralized authority yeah. and theology. And even Wiccans who say they're doing good stuff. We're just, we're mm-hmm. peace and love, man. Because you could even see them in, in hospice centers and yeah. and uh, nursing mm-hmm. homes. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've seen that in my pastoral care where like this, this practices are happening. Yeah. Um, and, and we need to be aware of that, especially for in love, in yeah. love of our loved ones yeah. who may, yeah. you know, not have the ability to recognize what's happening. Especially and at that point, need protection. Yeah, yeah, for sure. These practices are even more to be condemned when accompanied by the intention of harming someone, or when they have recourse to the intervention of demons. Wearing charms is also reprehensible. Spiritism often ap- implies divination or magical practices. The church, for her part, warns the faithful against it. Recourse to so-called traditional cures does not justify either the invocation of evil powers or the exploitation of another's credulity. Mm. So, you know, again, like when we look to Jesus, and, and this is why, you know, uh, awareness is good, and but we don't want that awareness to turn into curiosity. We don't mm. want to become uh, yeah. so consumed by this where, where we start uh, entering into this form of like, turning away from scripture, turning away from uh, mm-hmm. our practices in the sacramental life of the church, turning away from our rosaries, turning away from that gaze mm-hmm. from Christ to enter in into these spaces to learn learn it and master it. Yeah. it it's, the, it's not good for the general public. Like we need to keep our eyes on Christ. He is the authority and he is the one who has the power to save. He has the power to heal. He has the power to afford us yeah. the very salvation that we humbly bow before in his covenant and his blood. So yeah, what I was where I was going with that is what he mentioned about the prosperity gospel to me. Like there like this stuff is all around us, right? And mm-hmm. and the thing is is like being able to spot it, right? Yeah. The mm-hmm. spirit of that spirit to of explain it. it to my children. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's like having a security camera on the outside of your house and yeah. somebody sneaking around, right? It's is it right to be able to spot him? Absolutely it is. Yeah. Right. So, you know, curiosity is a different thing. It envelops, yeah. right? It's it envelops somebody. Yeah. And and that's a good distinction, mm-hmm. right? That that's precisely it, Delacross. Like you know, and that's why I truly appreciate Charles the way that you approach this, yeah. uh, because there there's even so with so much immersive occult practices in in our world, and I've seen these accessibilities all over the place. You know, mm-hmm. in in general shopping centers, like mm-hmm. I've I've seen them in all of these locations. Um, we need to be aware. We need to be aware. But even within the church, we see people just really, uh, you know kind of obsessing over this and kind of marketing it and and mm. and creating these sensationalizing it. sensationalizing it yeah. and it's like that's not that's You're not elevating good e- somebody's curiosity yeah. yeah and that's not good either so yeah. I, I like the analogy and that's such a fatherly analogy Delacrosse of like that sense of like spotlights on your house mm-hmm. like who's creeping it, yeah. around my house yeah. who's creeping around my kids and I need to do something about that and protect them that that's right. very important you know kind of following that analogy a lot of people a lot of cultists, Satanists, modernists, whatever, mm-hmm. a religionist, they'll say that the church destroyed all this secret knowledge on all these documents of all these religions because they they were trying to like they were trying to prevent anyone from know, knowing the secret knowledge. But being a, being aware of these and having these things in free circulation was dangerous. It still is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And I think we see that that you know awareness becomes fascination which becomes a se- obsession which becomes that's oppression how all brought in that's how they're brought in and like yeah. you know as a father look i see something that's going to hurt my kid there's a corner there's an open outlet or whatever i'm going to take care of that i'm going to get yeah. that away from them mm. so that they're not able to hurt themselves with it because they don't have the knowledge to be able to prevent mm. hurting themselves that's what the church does but you know these people say oh the church don't, doesn't want you to know this because you'll have power you wow you you 
they don't want you to eat the apple. You should eat the apple because then you'll become like God, mm -hmm. right? It's the same story from the garden. Yeah. Get this secret knowledge. Get this gnosis, right? You're being tricked. You're being mm -hmm. tricked. And, and we have and to, to look to the fruit. Like, you know, like you will know a tree by its fruit. Yep. Yeah. Is it a good fruit? Is it a bad fruit? You know, and, and it is. It's as black as white as that, Charles. Yep. Yeah. So getting into the second point of what, you know, all these people want you to know is, how are they luring people in, especially children? Because I think children are especially vulnerable. Well, think about when we were growing up, right? When we were kids, you know, the Ouija board was very yeah. active. Like, yeah. how do kids even get this? It's made by when a, we were growing it's marketed as just a simple game. But now it is. But when we were growing up, it wasn't. Like it wasn't it, it wasn't marketed like that. It wasn't like you could go to Walmart and, and scoop it up or something like that. Oh. Like it, it was in the hands of kids. Like mm -hmm. there's somehow there's like a movement that constantly preys on yeah. the youth and the children. Yeah. Why do you need to dance in front of children? Why does a yeah. Ouija board need to be with children? Why does these books need to be by children? Why do children need to have these conversations? Yeah. Why are adults trying to do this to children? Yeah. Because they're vulnerable and they can be groomed. There you go. Yeah, and that's and that's what demons do too. We, we they sense our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, and they try to groom us to destroy, mm -hmm. to lure us in, to follow after them, and then and then to destroy us. But uh, kind of to answer mm -hmm. the question you all brought up, um, I would say, uh, what was it? Technology. How is it getting to the youth? Mm -hmm. The collapse of the faith mm -hmm. and technology, because there's we're never going to live with uh, we're not a religious like we have to we we tend towards some kind of religious practice mm. if it's not christianity it's gonna be something else it's gonna be the occult the natural fallen nature disposition is to go towards superstitious practices mm -hmm. um, like look for what i want we live in a very materialistic indulgent society so you combine that with a religious inclination then you get the occult the occult goes after like what i want power greed lust money all mm. that stuff but so they are pitching, everything's being pitched to the kids. We were talking about that TikTok article about how TikTok's kind of grooming these like 13 year olds towards uh, suicidal thoughts and other kind of self destructive behaviors. Um, but you also have, so within technology of that, um, you destroy the image, the self identity uh, that you are in the absence, of the absence of the faith. You don't have like, I am a child of God kind of theology being given to these kids. You have this secular theology given to the kids. Like you are whatever you want to be. And it can be, so the devil marks his own. That's one thing I kept hearing. Like people mm. go into the occult, get marked physically. Mm. They get, they, they look awful. They feel awful. They have problems. Their lives are falling apart. They get mm. all tatted up, all pierced. Um, sometimes like transhumanism is, is coming out of the occult. Mm. Um, all these trans things are inside the occult. Ch become whoever you want to be, whatever you want to be. It's all up to you. And the, de the demons are just laughing behind the scenes because we're taking the bait. Wasn't that Aleister Crowley's whole thing? Do whatever thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Yeah. yeah. And someone pointed out, so one of the big things we can get into is that the, the occult is an inversion of the truth. Someone pointed out to me that that's actually an inversion of St. Augustine who said, love, uh, was it love God and do what you do what you will? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So love God and then do what thou wilt. But then Alistair mm -hmm. Crowley just takes away the love God part and just do what thou wilt, mm -hmm. which is a very subtle satanic. In, in the same way as like Jesus, I am the gate. We covered that scripture yeah. yesterday. It's like I am the gate. Walk through the great and then ha find your pastor. Like you know, yeah. come in, come out, mm -hmm. go do about what you. But it's always in in Christ. In so yeah. like the identity that flows from God who created us. That's the thing. It's like, you know, you consider like the whole sense of like my body. It's not my body. This mm -hmm. has been given to me. I didn't create this. This right. is that, I, I, you know, my the, the possessor of this is God. Yep. Like th that's why I'm baptized. Like I, I claimed I, I, I've been claimed. Mm -hmm. I've been named, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've been given an identity. I've been given a mission. I've been given a particular uh, set of skills, you know, and it, it, that kind of inverse inverse look at that you you can see okay you know is this freedom like mm -hmm. mm, it seems more like slavery you yeah know? in that verse about the the good shepherd everyone who gets over the gates by jumping over them instead of going through the gate is a robber and a thief and that's what these people are doing they're trying to get to the sheep by mm. avoiding the good shepherd, yeah. because they want to steal and rob cowards. from them. Mm -hmm. They're cowards who want to manipulate and yeah. groom. Yeah. yeah, they're cowards. The the interesting uh, inversion that you mentioned, I was just kind of contemplating that and how um, there's a false sense of, 
of like we all desire intimacy, right? Like God gives yeah. us like the most amazing intimacy in the Eucharist and confession, the sacraments, baptism. He mm-hmm. literally grafts himself into our soul. Like this, that's just very powerful. And and it's and it's out of love, right? And so these people don't experience this intimacy. They don't experience this love. They're literally vulnerable. Like I get that image of all the the zebras running that one's just kind of straggling out there and the lion's like yep i'm gonna That's get great. that one the, i mean even scripture says he's prowling about the world seeking the real souls like a lion yeah. but what what is inverted is the the sense of community that they have where it's self-destructive right and so the intimacy is is really just built around their destruction where god's intimacy with us is built around literally like our complete and utter mm-hmm. self that he shares with us, you know, and one of the things that was a lure was, uh, one of the, the wounds, the weaknesses, the absences that push people towards the occult was a need for mysticism. I heard this from a lot of mm. people they are being raised with some bland Christianity that doesn't feed their soul, but mm. they crave it. They crave some spiritual interaction with reality, with truth. A lot of them are actually looking for the truth, but they can't find it because no one's, no one's preaching, mm. you know, whatever the, mm. I can remember the verse from St. Paul, like who, how are we going how is someone going to respond to Christ unless someone's preaching to mm-hmm. him about Christ? Mm-hmm. So they go into the occult because occult, uh, the occult promise, promises immediate gratification of that mysticism. Like you do this little ritual, you open yourself up and a demon will appear, a spirit will appear, a goddess will appear. You can interact, you can have intimacy with these with these deities. Mm-hmm. And they do. These like, oh, I was a Dianic witch, oh, Dianic Wicca, I think, came up at least twice in my interviews. And they they do rituals with this goddess and they mm. experience the presence of this deity i'm like this is this is this is alarming because it's mm. not fulfilling them that's mm. one of the things that it's like you don't learn you don't learn from wiccans and witches that this is an unfulfilling practice that they're constantly constantly trying to get something that they can't get it's like the demons baiting them they come mm-hmm. a little more a little more you'll mm-hmm. get it here next step you'll get it here next step and they never get it mm-hmm. and then you're just going down 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 and down it's those gateway drugs i mean we we yeah. see it in in yeah. our fellowship with with friends growing up and it's like you see where it starts and how it continues to erode somebody's will. And now they're beholden to this immersive drive toward that high, that fulfillment, and it's destroying them. Yeah, yeah look at things like the prosperity gospel or look at things like um, Scientology. Just give a little more and you're going to get that next access. Yep. You're trying to oh, get here. you're there. Yeah. A little bit yeah. more. Give away more of yourself and you'll get this This has access. always been like Gnosticism. Yeah. We keep on bringing mm-hmm. that up. That's exactly how the Gnostics drew people in to those heretical movements. Yeah, and Gnosticism goes back to the Garden of Eden. The snake says, hey, eat this and you'll know, you'll know the things God mm-hmm. doesn't want you to know. Mm-hmm. And it's pride. Pride is the hydrogen mm-hmm. of all sins. Mm-hmm. All sins are combinations of pride mixed together with some other self dereliction. As opposed to self-denial. Yeah. You know, like the whole sense of Christ and being conformed and being signed with his cross at our baptism, you know, we're given the sense of what this accomplishes in relationship to authentic love and and striving after perfection in respect to being perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. It's like that benevolence, that self-denial, that that choice of the other over oneself. Like these are the things that begin to articulate true freedom because, you know, yeah, of course I'm going to be self-interested. Of course I want nice things. Of course I want to do all this stuff. But to deny myself and choose somebody else, like that has got to come from an action of freedom, true freedom. So St. John Paul II explains freedom not in the sense of doing whatever it is that you want to do, but in the ability to pursue the good for its own sake, that it is the choice of choosing the good in that respect is is what is truly free about the human person. And that's why children have always been, vulnerability has mm-hmm. always been the attack point yeah. is because it is our role as, as Christian men, as Christians to nurture, right? Nurture. And what they're doing is they're nurturing to that selfishness, yeah. right? And they're mm-hmm. destroying them because they're they're an easy target. And it's mm-hmm. dividing kids from their parents and families. That's Life, horrible. it's like it is horrible. Yeah. yeah. So the third thing, and I think this is getting to what you guys are talking about, is what are the real dangers? Okay. No, it's well, okay. People say, look, well, I don't know. You're reading a book or you're you're going to some Wiccan fair, and I don't know. You, <laughs> it's you, Wiccan fair. So you're going to a Wiccan fair and you get a turkey leg, market. and then you get a, <laughs> a you, you get a turkey leg and a necklace, you go home. What's the big deal, right? <laughs> you know, 
But <laughs> took a leg and a necklace. That's what he did. Oh, that was good to me. But what are the real dangers of either mine or dabbling? I mean, how does how does this uh, poison you by being associated with? What are the dangers of this? And that's the third thing that this book is seeking mm-hmm. to uh, show people. Yeah, and that's that's one of the big ones. Because mm. um, one interesting thing about the Ouija board, I touch on it in this volume. I think a lot more of it's in the second volume that's going to come out in a few months, hopefully. Um, that a lot of witches won't go near the Ouija board because it's so powerful of a door and it brings something through that you just don't want to mess with. So they won't touch a Ouija board, which I thought was just... That's interesting. Really. So, so in, the, in the occult, this is one of the dangers, in the occult, occultists are terrified of the occult. Like mm. uh, some uh, two Satanists, actually Anton LaVey's daughter, um, she has now, I make this point a lot, she's renounced Satanism. And so Anton LaVey was the guy who founded the Church of Satan in mm-hmm. San Francisco. He'd wear the devil horns and all that. Yeah, yeah big showman charlatan, essentially. Yeah. Just made it all up. The, the what is it? Um, the Satanic Bible was uh, created because a publishing company wanted something to follow on the success of the movie Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. So it was all a marketing thing. But she got, but real witchcraft and real occultic stuff was happening as a result. Because once you start talking to demons, they're going to respond. You're going to see the power, the influence. Um, but she, um, where was it going with that? Right. So when she did some interviews, which I pulled from, when she was a practicing Satanist, uh, she said there are certain things as as a black magician that that are dangerous. Like what what they are doing is a dangerous thing, and they would not recommend it to the audience that was listening to this public debate. I'm like, well, that's the 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 moderator was like, really? Did you just say what I j- thought you said? So occultists know that it's dangerous, and mm-hmm. I have a lot of those accounts. But even objectively looking outside, like what exorcists see and pastors see, like very quickly, if you play with the Ouija board, nothing might happen, but there is um, a legality, a justice issue, a, a sin. You know, every act of the occult is an act of superstition, which is a violation of the first commandment, puts you in a state of mortal sin. Mm-hmm. At that point, the demons can mess with you more because you no longer have God's protection. So two issues on the danger. If you're not in a state of grace, the occult is extremely dangerous. If you're in a state of grace and you're not dabbling, then, you know, there are diff- there's a divide among exorcists. Like, like some say, it can't touch you mm-hmm. at all. Someone may issue a curse at you and you won't even feel a breeze go by, spiritually speaking. And you have, but okay. others will say, well, you know, God can allow it. And we've seen with St. Paul, he had that demon that wouldn't go away. Um, so God does allow Catholics to still be struck by diabolical things, maybe through curses or whatever. But um, but the issue is grace. Like, are you in a state of grace? Are you following our Lord? That'll mm-hmm. protect you. But if you mm-hmm. go into the occult, if you start to dabble, um, the, the dangers are that you will get hooked. It's addictive mm-hmm. because demons will show up. They'll show off. They'll do things in order to bait you. They'll make promises. A lot of exorcists see that a demon will give. And often they're, they're, they don't believe they're working with demons. Like there was one new ager that I interviewed who said, I'm, he said, as a new ager, I was doing everything I could to stay away from what Satanists did. But little did I know, I was doing exactly what they were doing, wow. just in a different form. Wow. And then he ended up being possessed, oppressed something and worked with the diocese and was liberated on his own through a prayer routine that they established. But mm-hmm. he did the prayer work and then our Lord, Our Lady stepped in and he experienced mm-hmm. a, a true liberation from a wow. demon. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of the things you're saying sound a lot like drug addiction to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, that look, people who people who are addicted to heroin know how dangerous heroin is. Oh, big time. They know how to mix it up. They know they tell people, don't mess with this, right? Mm-hmm. But they're also always chasing the dragon. They're always trying to get that high. They're, you always have them to do more to get that and, high. And the thing you know? is, I, you know, I've, I've worked with a, a lot of the men and women of community Chinaclo for the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing specifically about heroin is, and this opened my eyes, that they are, it's always beckoning. It doesn't matter if you're sober for 30, 40, mm-hmm. 50 years. Wow. Well. Like that, that, that kind of, that's always with you. It's always with you. So, you know, to what you're describing as like the addictive aspect of it, Mm -hmm. that provocation, it's like when you open that door, like that you're opening up a door that, that can potentially have that same type of effect on you. And sometimes like, uh, I can't remember which one it was, maybe Philomena, the one I named Mm -hmm. Philomena, she, um, came back, traditional Catholic, very devout, but she'll say like someone will cut her off while she's driving and she'll have an impulse to curse the person. Mm-hmm. And she won't, but it's the it's the jerk reaction because she was trained so much and she saw the, the satisfaction. The curse may never have done anything when she issued them, mm-hmm. but she felt the power of 
of willing with malice mm -hmm. against somebody. You know, I quit smoking, but sometimes I'll get in the car and I'll go like this and I'll make sure I go to take my lighter out because that was just a habit, right? Mm -hmm. I go take yeah. my lighter and put it in the, you know, cup holder or whatever. Like those kinds of addiction things I think are very much similar to the kind of oppression and obsession that, mm -hmm. you know, dark things put on you. Mm -hmm. And they, I think this is where the awareness becomes a big deal yeah. because mm -hmm. one of the things about the mm -hmm. internet, um, so if, if we realize it's really addictive, like a drug, when then, then our awareness skyrockets, like don't go anywhere near these occultic philosophies, like even like health mm -hmm. and wealth, prosperity mm -hmm. gospel, manifesting, mm -hmm. any kind of me willing or trying to control God, even the subtle things, mm -hmm. astrology, uh, certain forms of astrology. Otherwise, you know, it's not a study of the, of the stars, but it's their influence over you. But um where was it going to go with that? But there was, there's an app. So awareness, there's a, an app I've been wanting to mention. Um, these spirit, what are they called? What are they called? The spirit summoning apps is what I call them. Yeah. But you can get it on your phone. One of the new agers that I was interviewing, he said on his phone, this is where he, he realized he was doing Ouija board stuff, but he mm. didn't know because he downloaded, um, uh, it's a ghost hunting app. That's what it is. Mm. There are thousands of them. If you go to like uh, the Google or Apple uh. stores, you look them up. Like I did an article on them on my website. They'll be in the next book. But there are, some have a hundred reviews, some have thousands of reviews, some have tens and hundreds of thousands of reviews. And if you read the reviews for these ghost hunting apps, they're supposed to like read the EF signals in the room and then you can communicate to the spirit that's present. People were having interactions with demons and people were actually getting out of like, oh, this is not a game, guys. Like, um, this is real and you could hurt yourself. So like witches wow. and new yeah. agers, occultists were coming in. And like, it's this on is cable a... network. Like, you know, like, and, and it's like, it drives it out to the general public and then now it's in the app store and then, you know, it's creating these. They sneak it in. Yeah. yeah. And, and, if, and, if and in gets... culture and movies, and I'm like, oh, but these are the good witches. They're fighting the bad witches. You know, yeah. they, 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 Howard, what was that thing that she said? The window, it's like a window that moves. Overton window. The Overton window. They inoculate you against it. They're like, mm. well, these are good witches. No, no, we think bad witches are bad, but good witches are okay, right? And then you're like, well, witches are can be okay. And it just always moves the goal. It moves the window. It's that like, it's, yeah, that's subtlety. There's a yeah. show it's, on it's, Disney But that's what drugs pitch. do. Oh, yeah. Like you take <laughs> really? it a little bit. Okay, I yeah, can handle it. I can drink popular. one drink, you know? Yeah. Uh, I can uh, I can have I can have a l one line of cocaine. It's not going to bother me. But then you start uh, building up immunity to it, which means you have to go mm -hmm. harder and harder yeah. and harder. And then and the people who are sucked <clears throat> deep into it. A big shout out to my boy Jerry Ryder, who who confronted me when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. Like he was just like, "Do not, Richie. I heard that you know, do not go in that path. You know." And it's like he came up to me with every amount of like aggression and like, but God. also from from a sense of like love for me being so sucked into that world and i'm like you know yep. and I'll, I'll always love jerry because of because i'm doing that but it, it goes back to what you were talking about before delacross it's like this whole sense of being groomed this whole sense of being conditioned formed technology being uh you know manipulatively used mm -hmm. to form to condition to groom and making these things available and accessible in different facades and forms, but under the same principles of the occult that we could look at those dynamics as you as you've masterfully provided in this in this book, The Rise of the Occult Slaying Dragons too, like giving a sense of this has been scriptural, mm -hmm. you know, all the way back to the Old Testament, the New Testament, mm -hmm. and all throughout these these uh, testaments of people giving testimony mm -hmm. to this is what's happening. And, and this is very important for us to form our children in the proper sense of awareness and then a proper formation in Christ. Yeah. You know, now going back to this ghost hunting app, yeah. that sounds kind of hokey to me, right? I don't know. Well, there's no ghost hunting <laughs> yeah. app or whatever. Yeah. Right. Maybe that's not but your here's the bag. Thing. Huh? But here's the thing. Number four on this list of the things <clears throat> that these people that he interviewed want you to know are, you know, are there actually demons associated with this? Or is this just a lot of role playing, live action role playing, just nerds doing nerdy stuff with putting on dresses and acting like witches and stuff? You know, is there is there just theater to this or is there actually demonology and actual demons involved in this stuff? And that's number four in this book. Yeah, and that's that's an important one because there's this issue of psychodrama that's talked about in the occult. Even some exorcists were like the, the power of suggestion is very uh, it needs to be considered when it comes to curses. Sometimes there's there's nothing happening. I wish a witch may issue a curse or Satanist against somebody, but there's nothing happen, happening. The demon does not have to respond, but the power of suggestion could harm the person. So even the, the occultists themselves, um, 
it's not so there, there is no intrinsic power to occultic rituals they, they're just concocted they're arbitrary they're not real god has given us real sacraments and sacramentals and they they work ex opere operato so the the holy spirit can, can you make, explain that for the listeners and the viewers ex opere operato yeah so if if the and you can yeah, qualify mm -hmm. if i leave out a detail but if the priest follows the rubrics so obeys the rules with the proper intention then the sacraments of the church function mm -hmm. by the power of Christ in the ordained minister fulfilling it himself. Mm -hmm. The priest is just a humble instrument. Just, just said, you know, what is it? It was the expression, just say the black, do the red, <laughs> yeah. say the black. Just, do the red, <laughs> say the black. <laughs> That's right. That's and right. then boom, you have the Eucharist. <laughs> like the, the priest is just, he's the instrument, uh, a humble instrument and very significant too. Yeah, Same and, thing with the And they say that about like, so even if the priest doesn't believe what he's doing, but he is properly That's ordained, right. if, he can, if he follows the rubrics, the sacrament works because it's God bestowing the grace. And that means mm -hmm. ex opera. Ecclesia and, super. And they, yep. and they yeah. have the, the, church the privilege supplies. of witnessing yeah. the power of Christ through the sacraments in people's lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that saying means it works because it works, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Opera, you know, mm -hmm. Operation. It works because it works. Mm -hmm. Not because the priest is holy. It mm -hmm. works because God wants it to work. But with occultic rituals, they just made up stuff. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that anything would ever happen is because demons use those opportunities to latch on and, and when you when you look at the occult or any Gnostic uh, movement, it's always <clears throat> invented by somebody of that generation trying to tie it to some sense of transcendence and history <laughs> yeah. and like you know <laughs> yeah, mystical. Like reaching, bro. Yeah, and it's like it's all pride focused. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what you should do? You should do exactly like the Druids and all the Wiccans of the ancient world did: convert to Christianity. Because that's what they did. <laughs> uh, Very you know? well. That's, that's, that's good. That's, that's what they that's did. Good. All of them. They were confronted with the gospel and they said. Okay, man, I don't know. This tree that we've been worshiping, yeah. probably not really our God. <laughs> Once you encounter truth, yeah. you have, like, where are you going to go? Like, right. It's like yeah. St. Peter, like, you know, like, you are the Messiah. Like, where do I go, Lord? Like, yeah, you have the truth. Where you, else will yeah. I go? Words of everlasting life. Exactly. Yeah. Like, see, yeah. I, lo yeah. I love and So that. all of these people that they claim, you know, that they're restoring this, you know, religion that was crushed up at Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They did it of their own volition. I don't care what people say. Oh, they were converted to the sword. No, they weren't. Yeah. No, they weren't. Just look to the history of the Toma of Our Lady of Guadalupe yeah. and really see what happened yeah. in the conversion yeah. of hearts. And yeah. listen to listen because she is on the ground with a lot of people mm -hmm. and has changed a lot of people, has mm -hmm. done a lot of amazing things. I can attest that yep. consecrating my family and and you, you see know, the fruits. You see the fruit. Mm -hmm. You see her presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the uh, the um, two things about as a Wicca, I think it is, um, yeah, Wicca. Every Wiccan witch, because they use the term too, is his or her, because it's men to own operation. Like you make your own spell book. There's no central authority. There's no government, so mm -hmm. they can make up their own rituals. That's whatever works. Like Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's one a, a lot of things they do, and I, I make a kind of a hope. I try to instill a lot of hope, like remedies and just like reflections that that Catholics can have to reach out to these people and bait them. Because if they just understood, if we just properly preached, like they would see the truth and come mm -hmm. after it. But so they they do something called a sacred circle. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's a pentagram or just a circle on the ground. And they do their rituals inside that circle. But um, they think that that's, that's a sacred space. And then one of the hopeful things I point out is like, we need more Catholic sacred spaces. Amen. Great churches. We so need if you want to be a part of a sacred space, <laughs> go on my website, knockatcatholic.com, support the capital that's campaign fun. because we are building a classically origin circle church yeah. not these circles not a sacred circle but <laughs> classical spaces that we can clearly identify from Judaism through Christendom all throughout these architectural expressions <laughs> that express themselves in Spain and Portugal and following that Spanish colonial revival architecture we're going to create a beautiful church in the name of the Lord for these sacred spaces yeah. because the human heart the human soul we thirst we long we cry out for what is sacred, for what is transcendent. We're always in search of it. And there's all of these things that get in the way. There's all these things that are being marketed to us. We're all distracted. We're all busy. We're all completely sideswiped by all this stuff. It is always Christ mm -hmm. within the sacred confines of the mystical <clears throat> nature of the instrument that is the church being the word being proclaimed, yep. you know? The good news and being people, realized. People will flock. Like one of the people, one of the pastors I interviewed was a, a connection because two Satanists within like a year came to their parish in a heavily Catholic area in the United States, 
wanting to leave Satanism, wanting to become Catholic. And Amen. the priest was like, uh, great, but I've never dealt with this before. <laughs> and two, like back to back, didn't know each other. Like what's happening? This is one of the things in my book, yeah. like, look, Father, the occult is in your town. It's mm. in your small parish, yes. wherever you are, it's there. And one exorcist I was listening to, I want to talk about the sacred circle too, before I forget a point. Um, one exorcist um, I got to listen to was talking to priests, priests being trained in deliverance work and maybe become exorcists or help exorcists. He said, he said, fathers, if there's an occult store or a coven in your parish boundary, those are your parishioners. Mm. You have to go convert them. Amen. You have to go evangelize them. How are you going to do it? That's for you. Figure it out. Talk to your bishop. But you have to. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, but that's what priests need to know. And, and then the they responsibility need to, for their souls. And know? then the priests need to understand, like, well, what is the occult? What are these people doing? Like, should I be afraid of them? Like, all that stuff, which I hope this book will help even teach priests. And then just go in. Like, I, the more and more I think about it, like, some people are afraid of witches and Satanists and things, but I'm not. And the more I've studied it, the more I'm like, you know, why can't I just go into a witch store and talk? Politely, you know, like St. Paul, the, the reading, like he, he goes into Athens, sees yeah. all these idols and his spirit is disturbed. <laughs> yeah. But then what does he do? He says, I see you are very religious. Yes. So he like learns who they are. <laughs> then he gets the right yeah. tone. Yeah. He's like, let me tell you about this unknown God. Yeah. Instead of just sometimes, you know, saints have smashed idols. Other times they're like, well, let me tell you why that's just a piece of wood. Yeah. And you stop talking to it. <laughs> so you don't, you don't recommend the St. Boniface. Go down and just chop it down, right? Well, I mean, spirit, you know, whatever the times demands. So I, I feel like nowadays it, it would be not the smashing idol approach. Yeah. Like, I feel like yeah. there's the Smashing Idols. We've got another lyric. That's the next book. Smashing Idols, part three. So I think that gets us into the last point that this book covers, number five, which is how do these occultists and Satanists and all these people break out of the prisons that these demons have created for them? So one of the ways that um, people break out of the occult is they start to realize the danger. They need a motivation to get out of the occult. They don't just one day just stop the occult. There has to be a break. And this is actually a really important point that one the occultist, former occultist makes. He knows a lot of people who left the occult, quit the occult, but didn't leave the occult. They never made a break with it. And he saw he made a break with it. You have to separate, sever the tie or else it's going to haunt you. Mm -hmm. And he saw all those people who are still and never made that break were still being destroyed. Their lives are being destroyed. Their kids are being destroyed. Like by... still being friends with some of them. Or is that like the break you're. Oh, no, like kind of break, thing? like totally renounce. Good, good. Renounce, uh, renounce okay. the occult. Like I and choose another religion. They would just yeah. stop doing the rituals, but they're still practically a witch or a Wiccan or whatever it was. They're a non practicing Wiccan. Non practicing <laughs> Wiccan. Yeah. Like a whole new category. <laughs> yeah. People have burned down on it, but don't have Christianity yet. Yeah. So one of the stories about the uh, the circle, about leaving the occult and the motivation to, to get away from it was uh, with the story, um, I think his name was Fred in the book. He was invited by a Wiccan friend of his to do a new ritual that the Wiccan had just discovered and to summon a demon. So this is one of the things, like people go from like, oh, like nice things, I'm just trying to help my life and other people to, hey, let's summon a demon. Like, so this is, you know, this addiction. Dude, that escalated quick. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so they did the circle on the ground and, and uh, the circle was to protect them. And this is one of the issues of, you know, people, pro, occultists know the dangers. So they protect themselves from evil things that might happen while they're doing these rituals. So they got in, they're like, if we're in the circle, we'll be fine. And they summoned this demon and the, this, whatever manifestation appeared, the demon appeared. It was terrifying, the smells of sulfur, like mm -hmm. it, it's full and blown manifestation sometimes. And the demon either looked at them or just said to them, do you really think that circle can stop me? Mm -hmm. And then the demon grabbed the occultist, not the friend, and threw him 15 feet into a wall. And uh, and then the, the the man, Fred, he ran and hid in the bathroom. And then they, he called the police. And the police got there and the friend was like comatose, foaming at the mouth, like had really been messed up spiritually and physically, took him to the hospital, he ended up being in like an asylum for 20 years and then committed suicide. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Wow. But Fred, the police like, okay, you didn't do it. Like they knew something weird had happened. So he was fine, but he bolted from the minor occult practices mm. he was in because he saw the danger. And that's a lot of, you no. Know, so the question is, how did they get out? So how, once you get out, how to get out is first you have that motivation. This is dangerous. This is destructive. This is killing me. Why am I doing this? Then you have to go to the church. Mm -hmm. Only the, And everybody knows this. All the secular world knows the Catholic church alone has the power to break ties, to scatter demons. Just look at the baptismal ritual. 
um, all the rituals, all the sacramentals, traditional sacramentals, especially with the, with the wording, is all pushing away the diabolical, summoning God's goodness, pushing away the diabolical. Mm-hmm. So they've, they've gone to the church. They've gone for minor exorcisms, major exorcisms. Some, simply by desiring to leave, um, or even just before they, sometimes our Lord will just show up and initiate their exit. I have several stories, two or three stories, of when our Lord showed up in the life of the of the occultist and broke the attachment for the occultist, and then the occultist could see everything that was happening and just fled. But often it's not a full break. Like one was in Hinduism. He's now a priest. He's been a priest for like 20 years. Uh, but it, it took him 10 years as a priest before he just decided to talk about it. But he was in Hinduism, was with a yogi that the Beatles used over in India, and a Christian missionary doctor came because their spiritual practices were so self-destructive. The doctor was coming to help them because they were in bad health. And the doctor looked at, at this man who's now a priest and said, were you, are you a Christian? Mm-hmm. And he said, yes. He's like, well, what, who is Jesus to you now? And at that moment, our Lord appeared in his soul, in the man's soul, and like convicted him that he must leave the occult, he must go back to Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. But then he went into some Christian esoteric energy group, like <laughs> as, a, mm-hmm. as a stop along the way until he went to mass mm-hmm. with an exorcist. The mm-hmm. priest was an exorcist. He didn't know. He didn't know that. But the demons started to show up at the mass just to the man and do all these weird blasphemous things. And he realized, I'm into some bad stuff. And then he talked to the priest and was like, I know why that happened because I'm the exorcist. Yeah, no one, no mm-hmm. one asked Pastor Blake in his skinny jeans to come and do the exorcism. They go to a Catholic <laughs> priest, right? Yeah. The, um, so the, the power, like the last several chapters are all about what the church can do, what priests need to know. The power of God is one of the chapters. The church is the great liberator. Um, all of the, this is one interesting thing that people need to realize. Almost, I think every single one of the former occultists that I talked to came to the church through the traditional Latin mass, the traditional sacramentals, or once they got into the church, they immediately went there. And it's, and this is one of the things that's odd about the traditional Latin mass not being, kind of being smushed, you know, nowadays is that these occultists are seeking mysticism, ritual, incense, smells, bells, like all the high stuff. Mm-hmm. And and the occult offers that, but it's fake, obviously, and dangerous. Mm-hmm. So when they leave, they go to the church and like, I want the intense stuff. I want the big stuff. I want the big incense. I want candles everywhere. I want vestments. I want chanting. I want foreign languages. Well, they know the power of a ritual, right? They know yeah. that when rituals are practiced that you know, this supernatural occurred to them over here. And they're like, if I'm going to Jesus, I want the ritual. You know, yeah. I want I want the highest form Yeah, and of- man isn't created for ritual. Rituals are created for oh, man, man, right? Yeah. And it's created so that we can focus our worship on God, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and when that gets perverted in other rituals, I mean, I think it's even the natural inclination. Even if you look at cavemen, yeah. they have rituals. <laughs> Like, you know, again, I keep going back to Chesterton, the everlasting man. That is the natural desire or like mm-hmm. C.S. Lewis, the desire of the desire for God, the proof of God's existence through the desire of religiosity in all people. They need sacralization of their life because it's imprinted. There's an mm-hmm. innate desire. You know, we need food because we get hungry, right? We need sleep because we get tired. We need Ritual, because there is an innate desire for ritual in us. And, right. you know, the Mass, when properly done, you know, whether the Novus Ordo or the Latin Mass, I mean, you saw how reverent yeah. his Mass is today, you mm-hmm. know. Those kinds of things satisfy a need inherent mm-hmm. in all people. Yeah, and, yeah and, you know, like the, the whole sense of, um, mm-hmm. you know, having the candles lit on the altar at the conclusion of Mass and exposition of the Blessed Sacrament and... And, you know, uh, insensation yeah. of the Blessed Sacrament mm-hmm. and the immersive silence among a hundred and however mm-hmm. many people, you know, and like you, we're, we're all before the Lord in adoration, you know, and, and coming before him and th- that, that whole sense of like, yeah, we're made for that. We're absolutely made for that. Um, the cheapening of the liturgy has most certainly happened, you know, mm-hmm. like in, in respect to um, what the interpretation and the and the liberalities of post Vatican II. When yeah. you read Vatican II documents, and I'm speaking to a former seminarian, right. we were both at IPF, uh, right. you know, unite once again, my friend, uh, in 2008 in Omaha, Nebraska, with uh, the institute. And but you know, we've seen the cheapening of of liturgical practices, and I think there is a, a revival t- of that sense of, of these practices, mm-hmm. but, but it, it does happen in a beautiful 
form in the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is that uh, we are united and and uh, subjects of the Holy Father who sets the liturgical practice. And we need to we need to respect our bishops and we need to and we need to be governed by them. But we also need to speak in the in the in the respectful way that you just uh, expressed. You know, the, yeah. this is a concern because from your studies, you're you're seeing a people searching for yeah. these expressions. And and you know, most certainly as um, as we design the church, you know, the church is intended to be that sacred space so that sacred function can take place in the operation of what the liturgical rites, you know, express. But I, I want to share just briefly, like the whole sense of, of candles in and uh, in ritual, there's no more beautiful ritual than the Easter Vigil. You know this four part liturgy. You know the liturgy of of light. You know in the in the yeah, Easter yeah. fire mm -hmm. and the procession and the lighting of the candles mm -hmm. of the baptized. You know, and and I remember being in COVID. You know, we and and Matt Deck was just talking about this last night when we were in the church, yeah. and we lit the candles in front of the Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph, and did that video uh, work for. He Pentecost. said it was way harder to put them out than it was to light them. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, like we we uh, we prepared the whole church with every single family being represented by a candle. So mm -hmm. at the time, I, I forget how many parishioners we had, probably half of what we have now. But it's like 1,600 candles. We lit 1,600 mm -hmm. candles in the church. And I will never forget that to the day that I die, celebrating the Easter vigil, that entire liturgy, going through all of the, all of the uh, readings and... And and really praying to it within the liturgy with maybe five people, you know, who were who were all on the team shooting it so that it could go online. And, and this and, is when they wouldn't let anybody in churches. Yeah, and this is when nobody oh. could be inside the church. It was it was powerful, you know. Yeah. And and it's those rituals where God meets you and He gives you hope. <laughs> he gives yeah. you He yeah. gives you stronger faith. He he communicates something and, and what that liturgy did for our parishioners and beyond, you know, we, we say we had 1600 families. I think like the view count, I forget how many, how many people it was like, like, uh, over 3000 or whatever, uh, views, like it, it affected something in community life mm. and, and it, it communicated something. Did, do you find from what you're from talking to people that the separation of from COVID and all this type of stuff from the last couple of years? Because it seems to me like there is a massive acceleration. That first we had COVID, then we had massive social unrest, then we had political unrest, and now we have technological advancements and unrest. I mean, it seems to be unraveling quicker than ever. Yeah. And when you were on the show the first time, this is right before COVID happened, you said, yeah. I don't know, from everyone I'm talking to, they're saying all the demons are they're picking up chatter that something big's coming. And then, oh, that's crazy! That I was on that episode. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, yeah. yeah. tell what, 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 hearing on the yeah. yeah. What did you hear? Oh, I heard something similar. Like this, and they'll see a theme, <clears> they'll see a thread. We all go into the science of what these demons are up to. Dude. But one exorcist had the demons talking because not all the time, but usually there are multiple demons. And they some some exorcists will say they travel in clusters. They always travel in groups. Others will say they don't. They travel singly, but they bring in like reinforcements or the network is there. So if one's there, they can just tap in mm -hmm. to as many as they want. So it's essentially like the whole army can be called in. But this exorcist got these three demons talking, and he just stepped back and just listened. And they were talking about the election of Pope Benedict. And they, whatever they were saying, they, they said, uh, she kept getting in the way. And the she was Our Lady. That Our Lady was interfering with the diabolical plan to frustrate the election process of the new Pope, of Pope Benedict. So, and then of course, current times, we have uh, the call by those four exorcists for prayer, fasting, and reparation um, on December 6th. And it seems like some of the news we were just talking about earlier was that the reason those four anonymous exorcists, that's important. I was like, who are these guys? And then I realized they're, they want to be anonymous for a good reason. They have been learning by mo exorcisms in recent the days chatter. and weeks. The chatter, yeah, the, cha the, the chatter and the diabolical channels is that they're up to something. And we something they don't big. something big. We don't know exactly what. Uh, Father Heilman, I think that's how you pronounce his name from Roman Catholic Man. He was talking about it on a on a show. I can't remember what the show was called. So that's like a developing story. I didn't even hear about that. So the, so the four anonymous exorcists are calling for prayer, fasting, and reparation. And reparation. Um, 
And that's to go down on December 6th, Feast of... December 6th. Feast of St. Nicholas, man. Beautiful. Yeah, the, uh, the Aryan. Yeah, man, what a tough guy, <laughs> man. That's a good That's a good feast day to do it on. It's also a first Friday, which I yeah. think is oh, why they picked it. first Friday. Yeah, they said it's for the purpose of driving out any diabolical influence within the church that has been gained as the result of recent events. Hmm. Which I'm assuming they're talking about Pachamama and things like that. They, yeah, they named that yeah, later on in their statement. Yeah. Did they? Okay. The exorcist yeah. did? Specifically yeah. because that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And they think that may have opened a door. Yeah. They didn't. They haven't said what. Mm -hmm. I think all we need to know, like sometimes exorcists don't want to tell us everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because yeah. it can get really dark mm -hmm. and we don't need to know. Then that there's like curiosity is in the book too. And that happened right before COVID and boom, all this happened. So have you been seeing anything like that? That's kind of you know, played out like that? Yeah, even in the, the research, there was a, one of the exorcists, um, they use seers, um, Catholic laymen who have a certain gift. They mm -hmm. can see, a lot of it is they can see demons. They can see what demons are doing. One of them can hear essentially the chatter of demons. And she was picking up this chatter, that's the word they use, during COVID time about, uh, which confirmed what exorcists were warning about right when we did the, the last show. Mm -hmm. You know, exorcists were warning about this stuff. Like, uh, not just them, but people with mystical gifts were picking it up too. And I don't think it's over. I mean, the COVID, as we saw it, d disrupting social life may have stopped, but the impact is still there. I mean, the surge of the occult that came with it has not been cured. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a disease that's still out there. I'm, I'm hoping that the, my book and the next book will help instigate, you know, a, a purge, you know, a religious revival, a Catholic revival mm -hmm. for the benefit of these people who are going after the counterfeit. Like yeah. we owe them, we owe it, the church owes it mm -hmm. to them. How can they get this book? How can they get Slaying Dragons 2, The Rise of the Occult? So my, my website is slayingdragonspress.com. You can order directly from me. You can get a signed copy if you want. I'm happy to do that. It's also on Amazon. Soon the book will be yeah, well, I have signed, a signed copy. copy. I right. have a signed copy too. <laughs> That's my book. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. I got it. Uh, but uh, soon it'll be available everywhere books are sold. I'm trying to get it. I'm still on I'm an indie press, yep. you know, so I'm trying to get it into the right channels. But Slaying Dragons Press, that's from me, Amazon. Amazon's fair to self-publishers, yep. too, with a good royalty, so no no harm there. Yeah, and there's a link below on the screen right now, and there's a link, a clickable link in the comments. So it'll be pinned at the top. So you could go to slaindragonspress.com. Slaying Dragons and Smashing Idols. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Trademark, exactly. Exactly. Trademark Catholic Talk Show dot com. This has been going on for four years now. I want you to know that. This, funny. Yeah, we our haven't we haven't not, let go of the lyrics not, of our song, and we want to do a music video to support your work, and uh, we may we may be able to pull that off. <laughs> so up. again, go to slayingdragonspress dot com. There's a link below. You can get this book. Uh, you can get signed copy, and um, this is a really important, excellent book. You know, we treat this subject of the occult on our show very seriously. You know, there's been episodes that we've recorded with actual exorcists that we didn't air because it's a very delicate issue. It is a very it's delicate a very issue. It's a very delicate thing because it's so dangerous. And mm -hmm. I think this book is a good training manual. It's not encouraging obsession or fascination with it. It's encouraging the right respect yeah. to something that's dangerous yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. And that's why we love having yeah. you on, Charles. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's before we go, I want to make sure that we mention our sponsor, Hollow. Hollow is a good use of technology, using technology to edify the church and the people. There's been over a billion prayers prayed through this app. They have people like Father Mike Schmitz. They have people like uh, Bishop Barron and Jim Caviezel. Jonathan Rumi. Jonathan Rumi and uh, Mark, uh, Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. And all kinds of people okay. praying through this app uh, so that there's uh, guided prayer, rosary, meditation. Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina, you know, Divine rosary, Mercy, yeah. Bible. The Office. Daily Psalms, all these things. Go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow to try that out now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before we go, another use of technology, when you're going to slayingdragonspress.com, you could also go to catholictalkshow.com and do a forward slash and throw a Patreon in there because we have some awesome gear to send your way. Charles has been using the coffee cup, the Catholic Talk Show coffee cup there. Boom. Yeah. And he's loved 
his water I out think of that his coffee, coffee cup. is better. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does taste better. Out of these it coffees. totally <laughs> tastes better. Out of but, uh, you know, to our patrons out there who support us financially, we wouldn't be able to do this without you. So thank you for your generosity. If you do want to become a supporter of the show, again, go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon. You'll see all of the tiers. And it's a way that you can help support the show as we continue to hit new markets and share amazing content. Just like Charles's work in The Rise of the Occult, Slaying Dragons 2, we look forward to that next volume, bringing you on to another show, a show and sharing more of the amazing research and the work that you're doing. May God continue to advance your work. And pick it up today. Make sure you check that out on Amazon or SlainDragonsPress.com. And we'll see you all next week. God bless. Mm-hmm.